Fourteen centuries ago, St. Benedict wrote in his Rule for Monks, Nothing, absolutely nothing, is to be preferred to the work of God. This is the story of a group of men who embrace that teaching. They are Trappist monks, and their home is a place called New Melloray Abbey. He is a Trappist monk. His life is one of humble contemplation rooted in the timeless gifts of silence and solitude. A rhythm of life divided into equal parts of prayer and work. In the end, his is a hidden life, a divine calling that nurtures the fertile soil of his heart. It is a life of stark simplicity with a single goal, union with God through Jesus Christ. Nearly 40 men make up this community of monks at New Melloray Abbey, located a few short miles southwest of Dubuque, Iowa. They are a part of a Roman Catholic contemplative religious order known as the Order of Cistercians of the Strict Observance. They are commonly called Trappists. These monks are part of a worldwide organization of men and women dating back to the year 1098, more than 900 years ago. Today, Trappist monasteries of monks, as well as monasteries of nuns, stand together in unity and pray as part of the oldest religious order in the Catholic Church. By the world standards, living life as a Trappist monk is a radical way of life. In a noisy, chaotic world, life here is deliberately intended to enter into silence and mystery, all for only one purpose, to glimpse the ultimate meaning of life, union with God. Our main function in the church is to pray. And I see that as a role of a monk. We're standing here in this monastery over a world that is broken and, and is, is suffering, as, we, as everyone is in a sense. And we can't do much about it except pray and be present with a compassionate heart to, uh, to be here for the world. And uh, we're not going to change too much, you know, there's, there's things, there's going to be wars, and there's, we're, not, we're not out there beating our drum. Uh, we're sort of a silent presence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The peace of our risen Savior be with you all. And with your spirit. We are here praying for the world, um, living in a community, but praying for the world.
I'm with God all, all the time. But, uh, the, the older I get, uh, the more, I guess, tangible that gets to be. And uh, the Spirit is with me all the time, and uh, that's the way it is. In the discipline of the, of the life, it's purposely designed to be a little dull and boring and routine because we're, we really easily are distracted. I mean, our whole life is filled with distractions of or sound and radio and doing this and doing this and trying this and trying that. We're in a monastery that the, the Cistercian, there's none of that. There's just you and God and the people around you and it's very routine and you're really denied that drug of uh, distraction. I, I like the silence and solitude. I'm happy to be here because I'm dedicating my life to God and uh, you know I have the opportunity to share that joy of God with other people. So I have the opportunity to love, I'm at peace, and I have joy. Like the more you, you, know, you give up, the more your heart becomes free for God and, and that's where the real happiness you know, comes from. God alone suffices. New Mallory Abbey rises out of the Iowa farmland like a medieval castle. Its limestone walls are a fortress of sorts. Some liken the monastery to a prison. But for the men who live this hidden life of prayer and work, the walls protect them and provide a freedom to be in union with God, resting in the reality of the eternal God through whom all creation came to be. Several spiritual masters say that the, the purpose of the monastery is to find your heart, to find your true self. So in a sense, your heart is praying all the time. You don't even know it because God is creating you at every moment of the day. And at that place where your life and God's life meet, that's where you want to live. For a Trappist monk at New Mallory, once he enters the order and takes his final vows, he will spend the rest of his life inside the walls of the monastery. He will die here. He will be buried here. The Order of Cistercians of the Strict Observance originated in France, near a tiny village in the eastern regions of the country called Cito. From that village name is derived the name Cistercian. The order would spread from there. By the 17th century, the Cistercians were facing division and decline. It was then that the abbot of La Trappe, Armand Jean de Rancet, instituted new reforms in the order. From that point, the Cistercians began to take on new life and became known as Trappists, the name most commonly used today. This hidden, solitary life of the Trappists is modeled after what is called the Rule of St. Benedict. Like the monks at New Mallory, St. Benedict lived only to seek and find God. In the early part of the sixth century, as Benedict grew up in southern Italy, the Roman Empire was crumbling and falling apart. That pagan, godless society began to undermine church teaching with heresies that differed substantially from the gospel message of Christ. Benedict, in trying to reclaim the world for Christ, somewhat mysteriously thought he could do that best by seeking out a life of solitude and prayer. While it was a revolutionary way of life, others followed. To keep order and a robust focus on God, Benedict outlined a way everyone had to live. He said it would be nothing harsh nor burdensome. His rule became the foundation and pattern of monastic life. Today, the rule of St. Benedict has survived the test of many centuries and continues to be the foundation for the Cistercian way of life. The rule of St. Benedict is supposed to be a practical way of living the Gospels. Our constitutions have a whole set of numbers of values that we live, and one is called mindfulness of God. 
And we try to be mindful of God throughout the day. Being mindful of God throughout the day requires balance, a rhythm, as the monks like to say, of equal parts of prayer and work, where their prayer calls them into work and their work calls them back into prayer, all done for the glory of God. You can't pray all day long and you can't read all day long. So our life is a balance between uh, prayer and work. We are uh, one of the few uh, orders in the church that strives to support ourselves by the labor of our hands. Many congregations depend on donations from the people to keep their apostolate going. But we, we have manual labor is one of our ideals. It relaxes your mind in a certain sense to move from, from reading to work. And then you work for two or three hours and you're ready to come back and pray in church. But it, that rhythm there is very healthy. From the beginning more than 900 years ago, the Cistercians have supported themselves through manual labor. At first, it was through farming, feeding themselves and earning money by selling their crops. Today, the monks at New Malaray have created a remarkably successful business that not only earns the money they need to support themselves, but also provides a unique and valuable service. The monks make caskets. Trappist Caskets is housed in a modest contemporary plant built on the abbey grounds less than a half mile from the monastery. Twice a day between their times of prayer, the monks trade in their habits for work clothes and along with a skilled group of local workers manufacture the wooden caskets. Sam Mulgrew is the general manager. We make and sell about 25 to 30 caskets a week. They go all over the country. Every day we're flying caskets to the East Coast, to the West Coast, all 50 states. We've recently opened a distributorship in Canada. Um, so we're pretty much covering North America. However, having said that, we are a small outfit. We're very finite. Uh, our manufacturing design kind of caps us at about 10 caskets a day and we don't have any interest in transcending that even if the market asks for it. So we know who we are, we're very comfortable with our business model, our modest approach to business and we have no illusions about uh, making this uh, a larger, larger than it needs to be. So it's all very fitting and very in keeping with a monastic industry. By the hands of monks raised each day in praise of your goodness, this casket was prepared for your child who died in faith. We ask you now to bless this casket. Receive the soul of our departed brother or sister who was laid in this humble bed as in a cradle, safe in your care until the day of resurrection, when we will all be reunited in the vision of your glory, who are Father, Son, and Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. It's not a common experience in society too much anymore uh, of manual labor. So I think it's a great psychological balance. And also it, it um, identifies us in a certain sense with the people of the world who have to work to earn their living. I mean, a sort of manual work, a lowly type of job. It's, it's not a glamorous uh, type of work. Mostly, I'm concerned with the work, doing the job right, because uh, there's a certain amount of precision in getting the ends lined up 
and screwing them in right, and uh, that requires a lot of concentration. It's a nice routine job. I can keep in God's presence. My job is to, to mostly is to assemble the pieces into panels. And so I pull those pieces off and I'm looking at them and examining them for the grain, trying to match the grain and the color. Um, handling them over and over again. I have all day long, I have my hands on the wood. And, uh, and, so, and then they're glued together into pieces and then those pieces are taken somewhere else and assembled together and sanded some more and the handles and the, and the hinges are put on and someone else sprays it and staples the upholstery and everything in it and then it's finally lifted onto a rack and at some point taken off the rack and put in a box and put on the truck to, be, to go away until it's finally handled the last time by that person's uh, loved ones and family, the pallbearers, as they put it in the ground. For me, the work is just an outpouring of prayer, and it's a continuation too, because um, you know you pray. Well, you can pray as you work in most of the most of the jobs because we're doing manual labor. Like for example, at caskets, you know, I'm just I'm just praying right there uh, as I make. I don't need to really think or oh, connect this thing here and there. I mean, it's um, I've done it enough times that I can do it automatically, so I can just shift into prayer. But in other in other jobs where maybe I can't quite pray as distinctly as that, um, it's, it's still connected to prayer because it's an offering, you know, like we do um, at Mass. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for the good and the good of all his holy church. And so you, what you're, you're, you're basically, I'm basically saying that, you know, God, you know, here's this, this work that I'm doing, let this be for your glory, you know, accept this as a sacrifice to advance the peace and salvation of the world. You don't, there's not like long stretches of eight hours of solid work. It's the rhythm in between that keeps, uh, keeps us balanced. There's, uh, you know, everybody's got their own uh, temptations and somebody, some people are workaholics. They'd like to work 12 hours a day or, uh, you know, or just get into something and, and stay with it until it's completed. But we're, uh, we're more of, okay, you got your work, and if you don't complete it today, you'll complete it tomorrow. At New Melloray and in Trappist communities around the world, every day begins long before dawn. It all starts with prayer. This initial period of prayer from what is called the Liturgy of the Hours is the first of seven times the Trappist will come together this day as a community to pray. This time of prayer is called the Office of Vigils. The time is 3.30 in the morning. From the book of Proverbs, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Oh God, do not keep silence. You not be done.
From the office of vigils, the monks enter into what is known as the Great Silence, several hours of solitude, prayer, and study. Continual prayer is not saying a whole bunch of rosaries or moving your lips in prayer all the time. Continual prayer is finding where your heart is praying and where Christ is praying within you. So if you find who you are, that's one of the secrets of life, to find out who you are in a spiritual sense. Uh, and I think that's what the presence of God is, is about. Praying and studying the scriptures is known as Lexio Divina, a Latin term that means divine reading. Used for centuries among monastic communities, it is a time of quiet, a time to read and meditate on sacred scripture. The centuries-old rule of St. Benedict begins with a simple challenge. The first lines say this, Listen carefully, my son, to the Master's instructions and attend to them with the ear of your heart. For the monks, the great silence is all about listening. In the quiet solitude of the present moment, discerning and hearing the voice of God. If people look at us and they say, why are those men living that way? What is it that makes them want to do that? And you'd almost have to conclude, well, uh, God exists, because that's what they're basing their whole life on. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. Farming is a mainstay in the fabric of Iowa and the American heartland. The early settlers here were farmers. Just like today, their main crop was corn. Iowa was the nation's 29th state admitted to the Union in the year 1846. Three years later, in the summer of 1849, as many pioneering Americans were heading west to find gold in California, ten Cistercian monks from Ireland came to the stark wilderness of Iowa. Trying to escape the horrific devastation of the Irish famine, the Cistercians had accepted the invitation of Iowa Bishop Matthias Loras. Some 1,000 acres of prairie and timber 12 miles southwest of Dubuque would become their new home. In Ireland, the monks lived in a monastery called Mount Melloray. They would name their Iowa monastery Our Lady of New Melloray. It would be another 20 years before the monks would begin to build their expansive limestone monastery. By then, the community numbered more than 30. From the beginning, the chief means of support was farming. Through the years at New Melloray, the number of priests and brothers has fluctuated. Before World War I, their numbers dwindled to less than 20. By the end of World War II, the community had grown to 150. Today, nearly 40 monks live, work, and pray at New Melloray.
From the explanation of the Psalms by St. Ambrose Bishop, we must always meditate on God's wisdom, keeping it in our hearts and on our lips. Meditate then at all times on the things of God and speak the things of God and understand the church. Farming for the monks at New Melloray used to be their main source of revenue. Today, that industry is not as profitable, and the community is getting older. Many of the monks were unable to keep up with the physical demands of farming the land. We started knocking around on what, uh, what to do. With some 1,300 acres of forest on their property, the monks realized they could use the wood from their own forest to start a new business making caskets. The wise people tell you, uh, if you have a raw product, do something with it. Don't just sell it as a log, make something out of it. And, and you add value to the what raw product. They wanted to find another source of income. They have a large forest here and they began to uh, look very seriously at uh, capitalizing on their forest resources, taking their forest materials and uh, making a finished product. Uh, one of their strengths was that they could uh, be able to present a serious product like a casket, unlike just about anybody else. Bill Haywood is the forester who manages the land and the timber needed for the caskets. I have um, two large working maps. They cover about six to seven square miles. The monks own two square miles of woodlands, but they're not square. Now, when they bought land, it was always basically by the 40, which is a quarter mile by a quarter mile, and then expand that to an 80 and so on and so forth. And so the woodlands that the monks own come all the way down through this section. This is the biggest area. We're standing right here. So we're right at the start of it. We could drop down, go to the right. We could go uh, almost a mile straight east. We can go a mile straight north. We come out of this area, we come back, and we drop down, and we have the whole woods that flows down through here. Three kinds of trees populate most of the forest, red oak, eastern white pine, and black walnut. This is a white oak. Okay. And this white oak started growing probably the day the monks showed up in 1849. Every, every time I cut down a big one, and if, if it's not too rotten inside and you can count the rings, I come out almost at those dates. And what happened back then is that these oaks were seeded into open areas. The woods might have been down there, forced down there, a little lower because of fire. And from here on up out, it's quite possible that it was prairie. And these guys were growing amongst those prairie grasses, but not thriving, just hanging on. Because the fires kept coming every two, three years, burn them back, knock them down, the grasses were very hard on them. And the monks stopped the fires. That's what the white settlers did. They stopped the fires, and in that 10-year span, all those trees that were sitting around started growing. And so they all come out at about 165 years, somewhere in there. Yeah, rather remarkable. <laughs> From harvesting the trees in the winter to planting seedlings in the spring, managing a forest of this size requires vision and discipline. These trees, with management, management that only has to be done every 15 to 20 years, it's these trees that are going to be the final trees in this wood. And so we pick diversity, we pick trees with potentially real high value, and we kept the species that grow here naturally. It, it is going to be fabulous. Uh, 40 years from now, this entire woods is going to be large trees. Some only 16 to 18 inches in diameter, but a lot of them. 
and some 20 to 24 to 26 inches in diameter and it's all going to be up. The reason that's going to happen is in 1995 when we started the timber management we started over 700 acres of these 1300 we started those over we started them from seedlings basically and so that's all going to come up the same age and when you come out here it is just going to be unbelievable it's really going to be hard to cut a tree then because it is going to be so fabulous the brambles will all be gone the thorny stuff everything underneath you'll be able to walk through the woods it's going to be special. I wouldn't mind being around to see it, but unfortunately, I'm not a tree. <laughs> Can't live 200 years. <laughs> Trappist caskets. We use wood from our forest. We have a large forest. It's managed by a professional forester. We're going to add value to their forest by making a finished product, as opposed to wholesale uh, wholesaling their lumber, which is those margins are are not that attractive. We're going to add value to their name. The Trappist name. We were going to add value to their an existing workforce. They had monks that could do work. Industry is not about uh, having any type of proprietary method. It's 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 standard join rate, standard heirloom quality join rate that, they did, that we've been doing for a hundred years. And there's plenty of good craftsmen out there that can make a casket. The trick about the casket business is being able to sell them and to represent the product in a way that would entice somebody to want one. So, uh, you know, the Midwest is great. Iowa's great for uh, supplying good, uh, good workforce, skilled workforce, we have that. For the monks, their call from God to spend their life here was a call out of the modern world and its lure of success and material possessions. A real, direct, and radical call from God to this world of prayer and work. When you're here, you don't really think of the, that you're radical. For some reason, uh, you get accustomed to the style of life even though there's a lot of deprivations like uh, we don't eat meat and we get up at 3.15 in the morning. Um, you, get, you get into that pattern and you don't think about it. Uh, so we don't really, at least I don't think many of us think of ourselves as radical. Uh, we just think of ourselves as following Christ in this way. You're leaving one identity and you're gaining a new identity. But there's a transition period and that's a very painful, uh, insecure spot because uh, you're leaving go of your ordinary ways of doing things, of relaxing by going to the show or uh, kicking back and uh, you know lounging around. And we don't have that here. And so you're giving up one thing and you don't know what you're gaining just yet. Once, once you have acquired the, the style of a monk, you see it's, it's what you want.
Brother Placid has been part of the community for more than 60 years. Now at 84 years of age, Brother Placid is the community's gardener. From planting in the spring, through the hot months of summer, into the fall, and the cold, harsh Iowa winter, Brother Placid's work is here. Brother Placid, in his prayer-filled work, finds God as he tills the soil, then plants and harvests everything from asparagus and blueberries to carrots and corn to peas, tomatoes, and zucchini. Since the monks do not eat meat, much of what is grown here will feed them throughout the year. In the monastery, the rhythm is steady. From prayer to work and back again, the monks are certain in their vocation. That call from God to seek Him here. It is a journey of the heart, a deep personal encounter with the living God. Brother Felix, a Chicago native, heard his call to the monastic life after graduating from college. He entered the order in 1950. I've been here ever since. And uh, so, uh, no, it just fit. It was kind of a perfect fit. Brother Juan Diego grew up in Lima, Peru. His family moved to the United States when he was 12. He did well in school and eventually became a lawyer. He gave it up to become a Trappist. I felt called to, to really spend all my time, my, my time meditating on the law of the Lord and, you know, uh, and just living a very simple life. And that didn't seem to be a possibility in anything but the monastic life. Brother Joseph lived most of his life in Wisconsin and Minnesota. He was working as a successful research scientist when God called him. Probably at one time, I think actually I knew someone way back when that was coming here. And I, at that point, I thought, well, what a waste of time. I really it just uh, hidden away in a Trappist monastery. It didn't make sense at that point in my life. But through growth in my relationship with God and being in community and realizing what's important, it starts to appeal to me and I'm just comfortable. We're kind of filled with our self-importance and uh, all of a sudden you just realize that uh, I'm here for just a few years out of centuries and centuries and uh, my impact isn't perhaps as big as I think and, and we can be content with a, a hidden life of, of a rich, deep life with God. Brother Paul Andrew entered the Cistercians in his early 40s. He had worked in St. Louis for years in the hotel industry. But I didn't think I wanted to do that the rest of my life. I just was sitting at my desk in St. Louis. Um, I had three weeks of paid vacation. I was able to buy a new car every four years. Um, it was comfortable. But I didn't see myself being at 60 or 62 or 65 sitting at that desk and doing that job. And I felt that if I didn't try this uh, at age 44 at that time, that I would probably regret it. So I took the leap. This is a life that is difficult. It is not for everyone. But these men will all tell you life is a Trappist. Well, every day is worth it. It's a contemplative style of living, which is very, very um, rare in our society. And uh, it has a component of silence and community, like solitude and community, which is a very hard balance to uh, acquire. And, and the, the apostolate is praying uh, for the for the world, basically. So, uh, and yeah, I'm very much in love with it. The foundation 
is an unrealization that I was created by God. I'm, I was his idea, not mine. And he put me here for a purpose. And just left to my own designs, I probably, I wouldn't be here. But I've, and uh, <laughs> unless someone felt God calling them to be here, they shouldn't be here either. And I don't think he could stand to be here. But it's because um, it's just fulfilling what's God's call for you. So it's not better than anything else. I mean, if God has called you to be a husband or a wife, that, that's so fabulous. I mean, I, I just, my friends, good friends that have these wonderful Catholic Christian families, they're just, they're my heroes in the faith, really. I've seen them pass on that faith to their children and from generation to generation. So that's a, just a fabulous call from God. It's really challenging, more, more difficult call from God to be a father or mother, husband or wife. But this is what God has called me to. And so I don't really need to defend it necessarily or explain it. Um, it's a part of the church that has been long, around for centuries. The silence for me was difficult. We had psychological testing here and uh, three things that stuck with me that I was um, um, somewhat um, um, retiring, um, that I was somewhat reflective, and to live this life, those things were both good things. The third thing was I was relational. Um, and he said, you might have a problem with that. Um, I entered a community, an older community, um, and uh, being on my own here, it was sometimes, sometimes quite difficult. I remember one January, February, uh, after Vespers, being in my room, and uh, just had the feeling I need to be around somebody. You know, I didn't have to talk with somebody. I just needed to be in the same room with them. So I turn my light off in my cell, and I go down to the library. The library's totally dark. So I go down to the, into the refectory, and the refectory's totally dark. So I go back to my room and, and just realize that this is the life that God has chosen for me, that I've chosen, that I'm just going to have to get through this and, uh, and live with this. It's a wonderful life. It's a good place. You know, I think I'm better. Am I better off now than I was five years ago or six years ago? And the answer is absolutely. I'm at peace. And the radicalness of it is difficult, can be difficult at first. But once you make that turn, then it all changes and it's beautiful and it's good and it's a great life. Like the days that pass methodically from one to another, the rhythm here is unchanging. As day turns into night and night back into day, as the dark and dreary winter fades away and the new life of spring takes hold, it is all predictable and incredibly meaningful. All the time praying for the intentions of the world with the deep personal understanding that their prayers are building the kingdom of God. So we try to contribute that charism to the church of, of prayer, um, of fulfilling that job that other people can't do, busy. Um, making a living. Um, so so we, sanctif we start out at 3.30 in the morning. We're, we're praying for those people before they even get up to go to work. Um, around the clock prayer for the church and for God that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done. Nine eleven was Needless to say, a significant experience around here. We talk about building the kingdom and our role here. Um, we don't have TV, but um, for 9-11, uh, we hooked up rabbit ears in the guest house and had the opportunity to go over and see what was going on. Somebody put a note on the, on the community board, so I went and sat for 10 minutes and watched one of the towers fall uh, on tape, but still it was like, I've seen enough. So I went to our, our prayer chapel and, uh, and spent some time praying. Um, a friend of mine uh, called a few days later and asked to come into the monastic center. And I said, sure. 
This friend was a therapist, uh, and he and his son, his teenage son, had been watching this 24-7 um, and needed to get away. And I let him know I didn't think that was very healthy for him or his son, that I was glad he was here, that he could step back. He disappeared after a couple of days, which is very unlike him. Uh, left the monastic center, didn't leave a note. Um, but I got an email from him a couple of days later. He had been working with the Red Cross for many years, and the Red Cross had called him here at the monastery and asked him to come to New York. Um, so that's where he was. He was, he was working with friends and family, uh, loved ones in New York, trying to deal with their grief, with their loss. And that's also when I realized what I was doing here. He said in his email that he couldn't do that unless he knew that I was here praying for him. That's, um, that's building the kingdom. Uh, that is uh, serving, uh, um, serving the church, uh, serving the world. As winter gradually gives way to spring, Bill Haywood is back in the forest. The job now is spring planting. This is a process of hand planting trees, just trying to regenerate uh, hardwoods, high quality hardwoods on these abandoned pasture acres. This particular planting, we're doing a memorial planting where we're planting a seedling for every casket that's been sold in the past year. Over the course of several weeks, he will plant more than a thousand new trees, all blessed by one of the monks. Even as these new seedlings thrive in the forests of New Mellory Abbey, we ask you now to bless these seedlings. In whose growth we celebrate the new life of our departed loved ones in eternity. We commend them to you in certain faith that your son, who died on the cross, was raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. By his resurrection, he has sealed us as his own and won for us the gift of everlasting life. Grant that through his victory over death, our de beloved departed may share in the joy of his resurrection. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Amen. And I choose um, usually three species, black walnut, red oak, and white oak, and then allow other things to come in naturally, like the white ash, and uh, there'll be a little bit of cherry and a few other things that'll grow with these. And over the next 50 to 70 years, these open areas will regenerate. In 15 years, you're going to be walking underneath these. It's going to be a very beautiful place. Making the wooden caskets here at Trappist Caskets is more than just a job. For the monks who use their hands to craft the caskets, the work is indeed a prayer. As they toil diligently each hour of the day, this work becomes a powerful and sensitive prayer for those who will end up using what has been created here. Sort of, it's like a cradle. Uh, of uh, your barn and you're putting a cradle in a sense, but this is the cradle that you're going to be resting in until your body's risen in the last day. And as, as people tell us, you know, it's a very emotional time of life when some loved one dies. And to know that a monk has worked on this casket gives some people uh, some consolation that it wasn't just uh, commercially produced uh, by a machine or something. But there's something about uh, the honesty of, of, a, of a religious person that people at that point want to connect with. So there's a spiritual dimension to it. So through the work of making these caskets, I, I feel like I'm entering into that important part of people's lives, that important moment of conversion. 
of uh, building this beautiful casket to enclose their loved one at this time. Um, so it is a, is, a, is a ministry, but it's a hidden ministry. I, I don't know most of them. Um, now, my, I, we buried my father in one of our caskets about a year and a half ago, and my 94-year-old mother in the nursing home is, has one on order, and I have other friends and families, members, who, um, who have ordered caskets. So I never know when I'm working on one who it's for. It might be someone I know, maybe not. But I'm touching those lives. And, and, and the people write back to us, and I like to read those letters about how much it meant to them to have the, the casket there. Maybe their father was a woodworker. And, and, uh, so when I'm working, I'm thinking about those families. There's a story um, that means a lot to me that I heard in the sermon. And I think it's a true story. It goes something like this. It was, it was a grandmother died, and the daughter was a little distraught. She didn't want to go to the viewing. She just didn't want to, couldn't do it. But, her daughter was interested, so the granddaughter went in. And so she went in and viewed the body, and then she came running back in a minute. She goes, Mommy, Mommy, you need to come in. They put Grandma in a treasure chest. And so I think about that. That's, that's what I'm doing. In, in the sermon, he was referring, to, of course, to uh, St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, where he, where he talks about we hold this treasure in earthen vessels, our bodies, this treasure which is the our life of, in Christ and the light of Christ shining through us in this body. But each life is a treasure. This, our, this, this treasure of my grandmother, grandfather, father, mother, sister, brother, daughter, son. These are treasures. And so when I think about that when I'm working on the casket. I'm building wooden chests that are going to hold this treasure uh, for these people at that moment. And uh, it's just part of the, this level and this gift that came from the mind and the hands of God. You know, we're all destined to return to the loving embrace in the heart of God. And you know, just in a small way, this wood from this casket arose from the earth in this tree growing in the forest. And now it's made into this wooden casket. It's going to return to the earth. So there's just a, there is a holiness um, um, and a rightness about it. As a, any, I'm a monk, so I'm a person of, of symbols, and uh, they have a lot of meaning to me. So, so whether my father was buried in a Trappist casket or a commercial metal casket ultimately doesn't make any difference. But for me, the fact that, that it wasn't iron ore stripped mined from the earth somewhere and put it on a train and to a coal-fired smelting furnace and then assembled like a automobile on an assembly line being welded by robots could come out the other end that it was part of a, a walnut tree that grew in the forest that was for years and shelter for wildlife and cut down and put together by human hands touched and caressed and shaped by human hands and of course as I'm working with it I just see the just the beauty of the wood grain it was the beauty of, of God's creation in this this living tree and the grain that's there and try to like I said, try to make the most beautiful wooden chest I can for the treasure that, that's going to be placed in it. So I think about different people I love or people that are ill or dying sometimes in work. But like I said, I'm really uh, I'm thinking about the people that are going to be looking at that casket and the one they love that's in it. And, uh, and it's our gift to them, and it's, it's just fitting and right for this, to enclose this, this beautiful person, this gift of God, um, in, a, in a beautiful casket. When I come answer me, God The final prayer time of the day is called Compline, what some refer to as a lullaby. It is a time to praise God for the gift of the day and pray for a good night's rest so these Trappist monks can begin it all again in the early hours before the dawn of a new day. 
The hidden life of these Cistercian monks, their call to a contemplative union with Jesus Christ and his church, is indeed a radical way of being, one that has been around for more than 900 years, praying for the world in the solitude of the monastery, praying to hear God in the silence of their hearts. For here, there is only one thing, God alone. Yeah. 